the changes that, that have been made uh, sort of last minute were very minor and just really clarifications of some subscripts and whatnot. So, uh, you know, what presentation uh, have you gone to where the uh, handouts have not varied in the slightest from the uh, presentation itself? But uh, nothing to really be too concerned about, uh, my, very minor things. The web seminar today will address the technical and organizational changes to the latest edition of AISC's seismic provisions uh, for structural steel buildings, uh, also known as AISC 341, and this is 34110. The provisions contain additional requirements uh, for structural steel and composite buildings uh, for high seismic applications. The main AISC specification, uh, also known as AISC 360, uh, the 2010 version of that document references AISC 34110 and uh, vice versa references back to the main spec the, the provisions reference back to the main specification. Uh, and that's just a note uh, to, to say where we are in terms of how this these provisions uh, apply. The main goal of the seismic provisions is to provide system ductility uh, during an earthquake. And there's probably several ways to define that. Uh, one of them is included here. We can look at system ductility as the ability of the system to maintain stability after yielding or overload of some of the elements. And as part of that, you have the ability of the yielding elements to deform in a stable manner, the ability of the non-yielding elements to withstand the forces that are redistributed by the yielding of those members, and also the ability of those same non-yielding members to withstand the deformations uh, that are caused by that yielding. To this end, the AISC seismic provisions take certain measures. First is to identify a target yield mechanism of the entire system, and then to designate certain elements as deformation controlled elements, the yielding elements, and then to design the remaining elements as force controlled, and lastly, there are provisions in order to protect certain critical locations in each system. Looking at each of those in a little bit more detail, uh, like I said, the first step is to identify how the system will behave and what level of inelastic behavior is expected and in which elements the yielding is expected. For example, there are three examples here. There's flexural yielding of the plastic hinge region in a moment frame tension yield or compression buckling in a concentrically braced frame, or the shear yielding of a link in an eccentrically braced frame. Step two is to designate deformation controlled elements, and then for those elements to design that element for ductility. There's a, several different types of provisions that go into ensuring ductility in an element. They are mostly prescriptive and pretty straightforward as presented by the seismic provisions. For example, uh, B over T ratios to limit our, the compactness of a, of, a, of a member or bracing for stability, uh, that sort of thing are all ductility requirements. In the example of a moment frame where the plastic hinge region is expected to go undergo stable yield, uh, we do expect the moment connection to behave as indicated in the moment rotation diagram. The second uh, step here is to design the remaining elements as force controlled. And as part of that, you design the members to keep them essentially, essentially elastic when we reach the capacity of those deformation controlled or ductile elements. And when you reach that distribution or where each of the, uh, in this case, the links of the eccentrically braced frame reach their inelastic capacity, the forces in the members uh, will be very different likely than they would be through an inelastic, in elastic analysis. Therefore, forces are redistributed at this level of deformation and yield in those uh, ductile elements. And the members are designed according to the main AISC specification, which more or less ensures that they remain essentially elastic when you reach the capacity of the ductile elements. 